Well, good morning, Crosstown Greece. Good to be with you guys here today. I want to welcome all of our locations as well as our online viewers. If you're new, my name is Jeremy, and I'll be your guest speaker today. It feels like that. It's been a while since I've been able to uh, preach. I appreciate so much our campus pastors carrying us through the summer in our core value series. Love you guys. But today we start a brand new message series where we're going to take the next seven weeks to look at the seven deadly sins, or as I'm calling this series, seven great ways to ruin your life. You want to ruin your life? I got seven whopping ways for you, right? It's going to be a series all about looking at sin. But with that said, we're not just going to take the next seven weeks to look at sin. That would be a pretty depressing series. What I'd like to do is take the next seven weeks is also to point you to the opposite of that sin, which is the virtue that God wants us to pursue in our life. It'd be kind of like going to the, the doctor with a broken leg. And you go to the doctor's office and they say, yeah, yeah, you got a broken leg. Thanks, Doc. I already know I have a broken leg, right? I need you to prescribe to me something that's going to heal my leg. And so it wouldn't be that helpful for the next seven weeks if I just told you what you already know, that you are messed up. And I'm messed up. And we're broken. We're all sinners. We need God's prescription to find healing to overcome this sin. With that said, though, I do want to talk for a moment about the the nature of sin and what it does in our life. Because until we fully appreciate what sin is, we can't fully appreciate what God's grace has done for us. I heard this great quote this past week, until sin becomes so bitter in our life, Jesus will never be so sweet. I love that. So let's talk about sin. Uh, You're going to see some sermon notes and scripture on the screen. By the way, I need to point this out because my wife told me that I should for our guest's sake, or maybe if you didn't know, but we have a church app on the App Store. If you have an iPhone or an Android, you can download it, and so you can follow along with the sermon notes. Now, why am I mentioning this now? Because last week when Pastor John preached a sermon, here's Pastor Jeremy. And my wife is like, they might think that you're like playing Angry Birds or, you know, messing around on your phone. You might want to tell them that our church has an app and you're actually paying attention. So Pastor John, I promise, I promise I was listening to your sermon last week. You can quiz me on that later. But today we're going to talk about sin to start. And the first point is this. Let's talk about sin. Sin is a powerful force that destroys and distorts. Sin is a powerful force that destroys and distorts. You know what got me thinking about is the carnivals that you and I would go to when we were young. Maybe you still go to these carnivals with all the the funky and cool rides, the the rides where they would go round and round. I can't remember the name of the ride, but you go round and round and round and round and round, and you'd be like this. You can't move, and someone would inevitably throw up on that ride. That was fun. Uh, One of the safer rides that we would go to in the carnival that I went to that I really enjoyed was the Funhouse Mirrors. Show of hands, how many of you remember the Funhouse Mirrors? All of our locations. It was fun. You'd go in there looking one way and you'd come out or you'd be in there looking a little bit different because of these mirrors that distorted your image. That's what sin does. Sin takes what is beautiful and distorts it. So I was thinking about this. How can I illustrate this? And I thought, I'll have some fun with an app and I'll get all the pastor's pictures and see what they would look like in a Funhouse Mirror app. And so let's have fun with this. Pastor Stu, everybody knows Pastor Stu for his epic beard, right? You saw him on the Need to Know earlier with our mission moment. How could you make Pastor Stu's beard more epic? There's an app for that. Look at that. (laughs) You're welcome, Pastor Stu. Pastor Tim, this is a doozy, right? Pastor Tim, good looking guy, very manly, not him. Go, Go to the next one. Very manly looking guy there. Then this. Ooh, that's ugly. Uh, Who's next? Pastor John? Pastor John from our Wellsville campus. Here's Pastor John, beautiful face. He gets in front of a funhouse mirror, and you got this. (laughs) I had so much fun this past week. A little too much fun. Uh, How about Pastor Eber? Pastor Eber is our Olean campus pastor, good-looking guy, normal-sized head for the most part. And then that. (laughs) And we can't forget about Pastor Levi. Pastor Levi here at our Greece campus. Pastor Levi, good-looking guy, and then he gets in front of a funhouse mirror, and you got... (laughs) You like that. Got distortion. Uh, 
some were asking in the first service of the other campuses, well, what about you, your picture, Pastor Jeremy? Okay, fine. Here's me before and then me after. Oh, how about that? <laughs> the perks of being the preacher. You get to do what you want with the... What's the point here? What am I getting at? Let's get us back on track. Sin takes that which is beautiful and it distorts it. You and I were created in the image of God. We were created to be image bearers, yet instead sin, us, sin made us image breakers, and it destroys us. It ruins our life. So what are we to do with this sin? Well, there's a Bible verse for that. The writer of Hebrews tells us, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Otherwise, you can follow along on the screen. And I kind of want to use this verse as a theme verse for the whole series regardless of whether or not we come back to it at any point in this series. I want you to filter all the sins, all the things that will ruin our life through this filter and hear the word of God today. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, this is what we do, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race That is set before us. So, what is sin and what are we to do with sin? First and foremost, sin is anything that keeps you from being who God created you to be. Sin is a weight that is on you that prevents you from running the race that Jesus has marked out for you. So, what are we to do with sin? We're, We're to run as far and as fast away from sin as we possibly can so that we can finish the race. Well, I love what Eugene Peterson's paraphrase in the message said of this verse. He says, strip down, start running. You know how sometimes if you've been here at Crosstown for any length of time, I'll say, turn to your neighbor and say, you know, that I refrained from that. Strip down, start running. We, we don't want that. But spiritually speaking, that's exactly what you want. That's exactly what you want. And then he says, never quit. No extra spiritual fat. No parasitic sins. I want you to notice how he describes sin. It's something that wants to eat you alive. It's a parasite that wants to literally eat you alive. It's extra spiritual fat, which I don't know if this is true for you, but definitely true for me. Every inch of fat on my body, I did that. (laughs) That was on me, that extra piece of cake or sleeping in, not exercising. That was my decision. I did that. And what is true physically is also true spiritually. We choose to take that baggage up, that extra weight that slows us down, which is why the writer of Hebrews tells us, throw it off, strip it off, lay it aside so that you can run the race in a way that pleases God. So again, next seven weeks, we're going to look at the seven deadly sins, which I do need to point out the fact that all sin is deadly. The wages of sin is death. So it's all deadly. Sin is sin. It's not like we're talking about the seven deadliest sins, but the other ones you you don't need to worry about. They'll only make you mildly sick. No, they're all bad. But what we're talking about over the next seven weeks is the fact that someone took these lists of sin in the Bible and categorize them so that we can be aware of them so that we can not be tripped up by them any longer. So I did some research on the the phrase, the seven deadly sins, and where it originated. It actually originated in the 4th century, in case you're curious, from a guy, ready for this, his name is Evagrius Ponticus. Evagrius Ponticus. Now, if there ever a case to be made for an eighth deadly sin, naming your kid Evagrius Ponticus might be it. I'm just saying I do need to be careful with that joke because years ago when I was a young, dumb pastor, we had some Houghton students visiting from Houghton, and I was preaching on Jehoshaphat, and I said, who would ever name their kid? Well, one of them was named Jehoshaphat. <laughs> Lesson learned for the dumb, young pastor. But I think I'm safe with Evagrius. If your name's Evagrius, come see me after the service. Uh, I'll apologize. So this is what Evagrius did. He began categorizing various forms of temptation And he called them the eight terrible temptations. And then a couple centuries later, Pope Gregory I 
took that list and consolidated two of them to what we now know as the seven deadly sins. So before we get too far in the series, I'm going to go through the list of deadly sins, give you the definition, and then suggest an opposite virtue that God wants us to pursue. So here's the first one we're going to talk about today. The number, number one is pride. Pride is this. Pride is the excessive belief in your own abilities. It's it's not that you don't believe in yourself because God created you, and it's not that you don't believe in yourself because God actually gifted you the things that you have. It's going beyond that. It's disregarding how God created you and basically assuming that you're it, that it's all about you, that you're ultimate in life, and it disregards God and his image on you. The opposite of that, I'm going to suggest today, is humility. Humility. Humility, and we're going to talk about that. Next week, we're going to talk about envy. Envy is the desire for some, someone else's skills, status, or situation. Where you look at someone else's life, maybe it's Instagram or Facebook, and like, man, I would really love to be like that person, not realizing the reason why their grass is so green is because they use some manure to, to fertilize it. We don't get that close to people. We just look at people from a distance, not realizing they're just as messed up as us. But we think, I want what they have. Here's what happens when you do that. You end up treating people without kindness. And so kindness is seeing someone, rather than wanting something from them, you respond with kindness to them. Week three, we're going to talk about gluttony. Uh, Might be relevant in today's culture, especially after today's uh, service here in Greece, right? Gluttony, an excessive desire to consume more than one requires. And the opposite, obviously, is self-control. Then we're going to look at anger. Anybody need to be there for that week? Anger? Be a good one. A strong feeling of displeasure or ready parents. Annoyance. That'd be a good one for parents. The opposite being patience. Patience. And then week five, we're going to talk about sloth, which I love that word. Could have used the word lazy, didn't want to, wanted to say sloth. What is sloth? Sloth is the physical or spiritual, especially spiritual avoidance of work. The opposite Virtue that we see in scripture is perseverance, is persistence, is that spiritual fortitude that God wants to cultivate in us. And then week six, we're going to talk about lust, which is prevailing in our culture, is a very powerful force. It's the excessive craving for the pleasures of the body, and that God wants us to pursue purity. And then finally, we're going to wrap up the series by talking about greed, the sin of greed, an overwhelming desire to have more than what is needed, and the opposite that God wants us to pursue is generosity. So that, that's the list of seven sins that we're going to look at in this series and the opposite virtue that God wants us to pursue. And you might be wondering, well, where did this guy of Agrius get this list from in Scripture? Because you might know this already, the seven deadly sins, that phrase is not seen in Scripture. Well, there's a couple places in, in the Bible, Proverbs 6, I believe, Galatians 5, but one of the, the clearest passages in Scripture where people take that list to get these seven categories is, is, is found in Mark chapter 7. And you'll see the passage on the screen. But here's what I want you to notice about these lists of sin. It's where they originate from. Notice what the gospel says. The gospel says, from within, out of the heart of man, which is the complete opposite the way we view sin a lot of times, or, or the struggle that we have in life. It's someone else's problem. It's their anger projected on me that made me respond to that situation, Right? It's because they flaunt all that they have that causes me to to respond. No, no, no. The scripture is clear that it starts from where? Within. It starts in our heart. Out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality. There's lust, theft, murder. There's anger, adultery, coveting, wickedness, envy, right? Deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and here's what they do. They defile us, or we could say they ruin our life. They will utterly destroy us if we're not careful. So what I want to do to start us off to to help us understand how we can overcome these deadly sins is give you two foundational thoughts that I want to carry throughout the whole series that act as a foundation. And here's the first one. If you want to overcome the, the, the seven deadly sins, here's what you got to do. you got to first discover the source of my sin. Discover the source of your sin. And here's the source. This is where all sin comes from. Pride. 
It's all related to pride. Now keep in mind that the, the goal of this series is not just to deal with symptoms, but to get to the root cause, which is why I started with this deadly sin first. Scholars call it the most deadly of the seven deadly sins for that reason, because every sin that we struggle with in life originates from our struggle with pride. It, it'd, be kind of, it'd kind of be like going to the doctor's office and because uh, you have a really bad cough, and the doctor gives you a diagnosis, and so the last thing in that moment you want that doctor to prescribe is cough drops if you have lung cancer. If they found out that you have lung cancer and the doctor writes a prescription for cough drops, you know that ain't going to work, right? Because it's just treating the symptom, if it can even touch the symptom. You want the doctor to get to the root cause. The list of six sins that we're going to look at in this series other than pride, that's the cough. The cancer is the pride. The cancer is the very thing that's causing a lot of these things to breed in your life to the point where they will ruin your life. So we need to be aware of that. And as we saw in the definition of the seven deadly sins, pride is the excessive belief in one's own abilities. It's disregarding God. It's not seeing God as ultimate, and it doesn't see God as necessary. Here's who's ultimate, and here's who's necessary if you struggle with pride. You. You are necessary, and you are ultimate. One of the challenges of uh, talking about pride is that it manifests itself in all kinds of people in all kinds of ways. That it makes pride, more than any of the other lists of seven deadly sins, so difficult to pinpoint. You say, does that person struggle with pride? Well, maybe, sort of, I guess we all do, but it's really hard to pinpoint because most people, when they think about pride, think of this movie, Napoleon Dynamite. Remember Napoleon Dynamite? If you've, ever, if you've never seen the movie, don't waste your life, okay? <laughs> Trust me. I was a youth pastor back in the day when it came out. Saw it way too many times. But who is the prideful character in Napoleon Dynamite? Uncle Rico, this guy, right? Remember Uncle Rico? Football star, 1982 quarterback, living in his glory days. That's the face of pride for most people, correct? It's that outgoing, arrogant, always thinks best of himself. But what we're going to learn today is pride comes in so many different faces other than Uncle Rico. So let's see. Let's take some inventory today and see if perhaps you struggle with pride. I think the first one is self-love. I think you can relate to that. That's what most people think about when they think of pride. It's the Uncle Rico. But have you ever considered other faces like insecurity? Where you're so insecure that you don't want to talk you don't want to do, you don't want to act when other people are around because you're afraid of what? What they're going to say about you, what they're going to think about you. Can I just point out that that looks eerily similar to Uncle Rico? Because at the center of your thoughts is not them and it's not God, it's who? You. You don't want others to think bad about you. And so you're a little bit insecure. All forms of pride. Here's another one. Uh, being judgmental towards others. That's obvious, right? You take the posture that I'm better than you because I don't struggle with that, and you do, and so you look down on people, and so you have this judgmental attitude, not realizing that we're all bad in many different forms. We're all bad. There's nothing that makes us good outside of Jesus. We're not better than other people. We're just in a better spiritual position because of Jesus' grace in our life. And we don't get that you project a judgmental attitude towards people. Here's another one. Uh, taking credit for things you had nothing to do with. We do this all the time, whether you realize it or not. The reason why you have that job ain't because of you. It's because of God positioning you in a, a spot in your life where you knew someone, and they got you that job. It's not because of you. It's because God gave you that gift to use for his glory. It's not because of you. God made you. Your DNA is his. He put that in you. He, he knit to you together in your mother's womb. Everything that you have came from God, and yet somehow we think we can take credit for things. That's called pride. Or how about this, a sense of entitlement, that others should be grateful that you walked into the room, including God, that you deserve what you get. That's pride. It's entitlement. Here's another one, getting defensive when others give you feedback, which I know no one in here has ever struggled with that, right? You're all very receptive when people give you feedback, just as I am, right? It's pride. It's pride. 
How about this, stressing out or worrying because you think the entire world depends on your contribution to society, that you can fix it all, and if you could just figure it out, you start stressing out, it could be a form of pride. Or how about this, an unwillingness to apologize for something that you did wrong. You just don't want to apologize. Or it could be this, it could be that if you were the one wronged, even though you did some wrong, that you can't overlook someone else wronging you, you won't see any part of what you've done to the situation because you were wronged. It's pride. Pride can even creep itself into the pulpit. I've been guilty of this plenty of times where I care more about what I want to say or how you're going to hear the, 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 the scripture point or the joke or the illustration than what God actually wants to say. That's pride. Pride is everywhere. Do you understand? It's everywhere and affects everyone. And if we're not careful and we don't go to war against pride, it will take us out and ruin our life. Which leads to the second thing, the second foundational thought that I want to share with you today. After we discover where all all, all of our sin comes from, it comes from pride, it's that we need to confess that we have a problem with pride. I need to confess that I actually have a problem with pride. You know, the ironic thing about a message about pride is that the people who need to hear it the most actually hear it the least. The people are nodding their heads. They're like the ones I know are struggling with this. The people are just like glazed over. You might not be hearing it. The people that need it the most are usually the people that are blind to it the most. And so this week, I was really praying that God would reveal to me, he would reveal to you how pride pops up in our life. And I think one of the ways that we know how God speaks to us is through his word. God's word is his will, and his will is his word. We know what God wants us to do with our sin and how he wants us to live our lives. When we read God's word, he actually speaks to us through his word. So first and foremost, get into the word and let it speak to you. But I also think that God begins to tug on our hearts when we're blind to those blind spots in our our life called sin through the people that are closest to us. They begin to tell us things, and God uses those people to convict us. So I was thinking about this, and I didn't want to share because I'm too prideful. But I think if you were to ask my wife, Erin, where I struggle with pride, I think she would maybe say a lot of stuff. You should probably not. But uh, I think one of the areas where she would say I struggle with pride is that um, sometimes I think I'm always right. Did you get that? Sometimes. I think I'm always right. I think there's a technical term for that, and it's called being opinionated, which I perhaps sometimes have opinions, and that can be damaging. And here's why that can be damaging. Because if I take the posture where I'm always right and other people don't have input and valuable feedback, then I'm more apt to not listen, and I'm far less likely to show empathy to that person. How did I do, sweetheart, with my self-diagnosis? Okay, you don't have to be so happy about that. <laughs> I think if you were to ask our, um, our staff, our pastors, our, our elders, where I struggle with pride in the workplace, it would be, and I've heard this before, um, that I sometimes talk too much in the meetings. Like, I do, I do the majority of the talking, which... Sometimes, as a leader, you have to talk and set the agenda and keep things moving. But if you take a posture where you're dominating the conversation, then you're sending a message to the other people that their input's not as valuable and that they're not honored. That can lead to pride. Now, I recognize these things, and I'm trying, and I'm seeing improvement in those, in those areas, but one of the coolest things happened this past week at staff meeting. We were listening to a leadership podcast um, by Craig Rochelle. I think it was called Leading Yourself Well, How to Lead Yourself Better or Well. Um, you can look it up on YouTube if you'd like to watch it. But it was really cool for us to engage with this podcast of where we have blind spots in our own leadership, how we need to improve to become more like Jesus. And he gave a bunch of examples on the uh, leadership podcast of perhaps some things that you could struggle with. And what was really ironic is that every single person on the Zoom call in our staff had like different things that they struggle with. 
a couple similarities, but we all had unique things. And he said to give each other permission to speak into each other's lives when we see those things happen in each other. And we all agreed that we would do that. And it was this cool moment that we could have some built-in accountability with each other to spur each other on to grow. But listen, church, that doesn't happen if you got a room full of people who are so blinded by their pride that they're all that in a bag of chips, that they're perfect. It doesn't happen. So you first need to confess that sin. I love what um, C.S. Lewis once said about pride. He said, according to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It's a great way to describe that. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. It is pride which has been the chief cause of misery in every nation, in every family, since the world began. Mere flea bites in comparison. The complete anti-state of God and the chief cause of all misery. Think it'll ruin your life? Absolutely it will. In fact, you've probably heard a Bible verse about that, even if you're new to church. Even if you haven't been um, going to church very long, maybe you're not even a believer here today, you've probably heard at least one Bible verse from the Old Testament. Ready for this? Pride goes before the, help me out, pride goes before the fall. You heard of it. Straight from Scripture, Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs are full of wisdom and speak to this issue of pride. Proverbs 13, 10. This is great relationship advice, by the way. Where there is strife, there is pride. So where there's arguments, where there's disagreements, where there's you know, couples getting at each other, having a fight, there's pride. But wisdom is found in those who take advice. I was thinking about this. Of all the things that Aaron and I have fought over the last 18 years of our marriage, there's one common denominator in all the fights, and that is pride. And I would say I've been wrong at least 49% of the time. I'm big enough to admit that. Wisdom, though, what's wisdom? Wisdom is found in taking the advice of others. Uh, There's another great Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15, that says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Think about that. Have you ever talked to someone who thought they were wrong? At least in the beginning stage of the conversation. Here's the thing about that verse. Both the wise and the foolish person think they're right in the conversation, don't they? It's not like you've ever heard someone say, well, this is what I believe, but I'm pretty sure I'm wrong. No, both smart people and stupid people, wise people and foolish people think they're right, at least at the the initiation of the conversation, no matter what the topic is. But here's the key difference. The wise person, while he thinks he's right, will also be willing to listen to the counsel of others. The dumb person, the foolish person, doesn't want to hear it at all, and shuts himself out from the very people that very well could save them from years of grief and allow them to grow in their faith with Jesus if they would just listen. So how do we overcome this specific pride of sin? Here's the one big idea that I want you to walk away with. This is how you got to defeat sin. It's very simple. Humble yourself before God. If you want to Defeat pride in your life. You have to humble yourself before God. I'm going to give you two verses to memorize. Two apostles, Peter and James. 1 Peter 5, 6 says this, So humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Rather than posturing yourself above people, put yourself below God's mighty hand. And at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. And then the apostle James says, But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. God opposes pride, which means that if you are a prideful person, God opposes who? You. 
Last time I checked, you do not want to be face to face with God opposing him. And so it says, therefore, submit yourselves to God, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So both these giants of the faith, right? Peter and James, both of them say the key to overcoming pride is humility. It's humility. This past week, I was thinking about how to best help our church cultivate a heart of humility. Uh, I thought, what, what would be some of the habits of humility that if embraced and practiced over the course of weeks, months, a lifetime, would actually kill the pride in our life? And I came up with a list of five things. I say that not to overwhelm you, but to get you to focus on at least one of those things this week. You don't have to do them all today or this week, but just choose one. And I think the first two are really fundamental to what we're talking about today. Here's number one, actions of humility. Why don't you take a closer look at how God actually saved you? And this is assuming that you're a Christian. I wouldn't assume that everybody here is a Christian, a Christ follower. Maybe you're not there yet. We're glad that you're here because I think that's an important part of receiving Jesus is just checking out what the claims of Christianity are all about. But if you have received Jesus, would you take a moment, even just during a quiet time this week or maybe this afternoon, would you take a moment and consider where your life was before Christ, how God drew you to his heart, and what your life is after Christ because of the Holy Spirit in your life? And then ask the question, did I have anything to do with any of it? Was it all mercy, or was there some merit that I contributed? And the answer is, Christians, is it's all mercy. It's all grace. You had nothing to do with your salvation. Um, in preparation for this sermon, I, I listened to, I got this thought from uh, Pastor John Piper. He has a great YouTube podcast, or whatever you want to call it. But if you go to YouTube and, and search Ask John Piper, Ask Pastor John, there's a great episode called How Do I Kill Sin? There was a young lady who was struggling with pride in her life, and she asked this question, how do I kill pride in my life? And uh, Piper just walked them through some scriptures. He pointed out that Ephesians 2, Paul says, the Apostle Paul says, for you have been saved by grace through faith, and this is a gift of God so that no one can what? Boast. He walked through scriptures where the Apostle Paul said, um, what do you have that you have not yet received? What do you have that you just didn't, weren't given by someone? Everything you were given, right? So why would you boast? And then he walks through scriptures where the Apostle Paul says, God chose the weak to shame the strong. He chose the, 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 the foolish to shame the, the wise. He chose the despised of this world. In other words, God chose you. And he chose me. We had nothing to do with our salvation. And the moment that we think we have something to do with our salvation is the moment that we step into pride. Piper says this. I love this quote. Listen to it. Jesus died to kill my pride. Why did Jesus die? He, one of the biggest reasons was he died to kill your pride. Every boast, therefore, mocks the suffering of Jesus. And every humble attitude and act of faith glorifies God. So would you take some time this week to actually consider how, how did God save you? How did you come into a relationship with Jesus? That alone, that thought alone should humble us to the core. So if that was one of the fundamental things I want you to get from the actions of humility, here's the next one. It's seeing God in his proper place, and then it's also elevating scripture to its proper authority in your life. And that is this. When you're face to face with a problem and you don't know what to do, what decision to make, how about this? Why don't we first ask, what does God's word say? And then choose to obey. And here, here's why that's important. Because usually when we're face to face with a problem, emotion starts to creep into our life. We start to worry. We start to get anxious a little bit. And, and then we start to look inwardly and ask, well, what, what should I do? What should I do? And you look at your own wisdom, your own advice, your own abilities, or you bring in another friend or a parent and you say, well, what do you think? And you look to their wisdom, advice, or abilities. And yet the whole time God, God is going, I got a book for that. I wrote a book for that. And so what he wants you to do is, if this is a, the authoritative work in your life, it doesn't mean that you're 
wisdom doesn't count, it doesn't mean that other people's wisdom doesn't count, but you're placing those below the very source of wisdom that should be ultimate in your life. It sounds so simple, and yet I know in my own life there's a tendency to not run there first, and yet that's what we're called to do. Here's a third action of humility that you might consider. It's a little more nuanced, maybe something a little bit more practical that you can do right away this week, and that is look for opportunities to compliment others. Look for opportunities to compliment others. Um, In Mere Christianity, that quote that I shared from you uh, from C.S. Lewis, a little bit further on, if you read in that section of the book, he talks about pride being compared to competition. He said that pride is essentially competitive. And the reason why it's competitive is because Outside of competition and being competitive, I don't really care how much I make, what I look like, and the status in life that I have. It's only when it's compared to someone else. Then I care if I'm you know, better looking, make more money in a better situation in life because I'm comparing myself to someone else. But if you take competition out, you take pride away. And so one of the best things that you can do to deconstruct the toxic nature of competition and pride is to learn to see the good in other people, to learn to celebrate their God-given abilities and talents rather than focus on yourself, where they become first and you become last. I think there's a Bible verse for that, right? So here's what you could do, practically speaking. There's Monday through Friday, five days. How about we learn to strive for five, where you choose five people that you can compliment, show encouragement to, speak out to their God-given abilities so that you can show honor to them. Takes the focus off of you, onto them, leads to more humility. And here's number four, and I know no one struggles with this next one, right? I know no one struggles with this. Resist sarcasm. I looked up the word sarcasm. Here's what the word sarcasm means. Mockery, ridicule, scoffing. You've heard it said before that there's an element of truth in all sarcasm, right? And so it's literally the tearing down so that you can build yourself up. And I know no one has struggled with that in here, so we might as well move on to the next one, right? But resist it. Resist it. Or how about this, number five? Speak gently and practice silence. Speak gently and practice silence. I I was thinking about the most humble people that I know in my life, And there's one common thing in all of them. They all talk quietly. They're really quiet people. I admire them, not because they talk quietly, but because when they do talk, everybody listens. Everybody listens. We we had an elder um, who recently retired. We had a couple of elders like this on our elder board. And they wouldn't talk much in the elder meeting, but when they did talk, you know what people did? They listened. Because over and over again, they personified humility and wisdom in their life. They practice silence. Um, James 1.19, one of my favorite verses, James tells us to be um, slow to speak, slow to become angry, quick to listen. Those three elements, be slow to speak, slow to anger, be more apt to listen, actually lead to a life of humility. Again, my intention of giving you those five things is not to overwhelm you. It's just for you to consider one thing this week that you would choose. So if you can put that back up on the screen there, Dan. Those five things, here's what I want you to do. Take your connection card right now. Everybody pull it out at all of our locations. And on the comment section of your connection card, I want you to write the number that you're planning on um, focusing on this week. I'll let you cheat if you have to choose two because the first one's so fundamental or the second one's so fundamental. That's fine. But try to write down a number. You don't have to spell out the whole sentence. But a number that we, the pastors and elders, can be praying for this week for you so that collectively as a church, we really can take this issue of pride seriously and seek humility for our life. Because at the end of the day, if you want to overcome pride, You need to strive for humility. And that's what pastors and elders are for. We're here to support you in that journey. And so please let us know so that we can pray for you and that you can actually put into practice. We don't just share this stuff so that you can just learn about it. We we want you to put into practice what we're talking about today. At the end of the day, no one wants to look like Pastor Stu's beard, right? Can you all agree on that? Or Pastor Tim's face? 
Pastor John, spiritually speaking, or physically speaking too, we don't want to look like the funhouse mirror pictures. So if we don't want to look distorted, and if we don't want to let these seven things ruin our life, then we have to be humble. And the only way we can be humble is by looking at the only one who is purely humble, and that's Jesus. And so I want to end with this passage of Scripture from Philippians 2. Paul says this of Jesus, who was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen? I want to invite our worship teams to come forward as we um, close in prayer. Jesus, we ask that you would um, allow us to be humble. You can't just say, be humble and make it happen, Lord. It doesn't work like that. This is an act of grace where you kill us from the inside out. You destroy that pride that seeks attention, that is so apt to be judgmental, that won't extend forgiveness, or if we're wronged, won't see how we've wronged others. Lord, we recognize today that pride is a very, very toxic thing in our own personal life and in our relationships, Lord. And we're here today just to pause and to humble ourselves and to ask that you would do that work in us. Help us see your word as authoritative over everything. Help us truly appreciate and value how you saved us, Lord. That while we were dead in our transgressions, you reached down and pulled us out of the pit. God, I pray that we would see the good in other people. Rather than see life as a competition, we would learn to celebrate other people's good. And ultimately, Lord, I pray that we would look Only to you. Because when we look at your life, what we see is pure humility. Pray that we would keep you as the center of our focus and attention. And what you do, we do. What you say, we want to say. And it's in your name we ask this. Amen.